Now let me read verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, Jesus Christ refers to God the Son here. So you see, we have had the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits, and from him who is, who was, and who is to come. That refers to God the Father, we believe. So that the Trinity is mentioned here now. And from Jesus Christ, he's the faithful witness, and he's the first begotten of the dead. Now, we have here these titles that are given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the interesting thing is, there are seven titles here. First of all, he's the faithful witness. Jesus Christ is the only trustworthy witness to the facts of this book. He's the one. And he is the only trustworthy witness for you and me today. It's difficult to believe other people but we can believe the Lord Jesus. And the facts here are about him, and he testifies here of himself. Now, will you notice, the second is, he's the firstborn of the dead. Now, firstborn in the Greek is prototokos, and that has to do to his resurrection, as you can see. He is the firstborn from the dead. He was the first to rise from the dead, never to die again. And this is a rather marvelous picture that you have here. Death was a womb which bore him. He came out of death in life. And in other words, the tomb was a womb as far as he was concerned. Now, he's the only one back from the dead in a glorified body. No one else has come that route yet but his own are to follow him in resurrection. And the rapture will be next, and then the revelation when he comes to the earth. And that'll be mentioned here. Now, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. That speaks of his ultimate position during the millennium, when every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that he's the Lord. Now, the fourth title that we have here, a method of identification, a sevenfold identification, the fourth is unto him that loves. It's in the present tense, and it emphasizes his constant attitude toward his own. Now, this book ought not to frighten you too much because of the fact it's from the one who loves us. And he didn't just love us when he died on the cross, although that's true, but he loves us today. Right this moment, Jesus loves you. And the fifth, he loosed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, today, unfortunately, there are many, I probably shouldn't say many, because as far as I know, there are only a few, even good men today, that are, to my judgment, making light of the blood of God. And the important thing is that the blood of Christ is very important. It's not just a symbol. You remember, God taught his people in the Old Testament, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar. Now, when Christ shed his blood, and I think every drop came out of his body, he gave that for you and for me. What did he give? His life if you please. Very frankly, I'm not inclined to belittle the blood of Christ. And I still like to sing the song, only I don't sing, but I like for the song to be sung, and I like to listen to it. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And Peter wrote, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And because of that, 
Paul could write to a young preacher, Timothy, and say, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he's that because he shed his blood for me. He loosed us from our sins in his own blood. What a wonderful, glorious thing. Now, when we come to verse 6 here, "...and he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever." Well, now we come to the sixth thing, and I must change this here. "...he hath made us a kingdom of priests unto his God and Father." Now, believers are never called kings. And frankly, I don't get wrought up over this song that has been so popular. The king is coming. No, when the king comes, he's coming to the earth. He's going to put down all unrighteousness. We're going to see the attitude toward his coming. But when he comes, for me, he's coming as my Savior. He comes as the bridegroom for his bride, the church that he loved and gave himself for. It. He's coming, the one who is the lover of my soul. And I just don't get wrought up over the king is coming. Now, if you want to get wrought up, that's your business. You get wrought up. But believers are not called kings. And our relationship to him is he's our Lord but he's first of all our Savior. But here it means that we're a kingdom of priests, and we're going to reign with him. Now he says here, unto God and his Father. Why didn't he say our Father? Because of the fact he is his Father in a sense that he is not our Father. You see, that's his position in the Trinity. We become sons of God through regeneration, being born from above. It's a relationship he has in the Trinity. We become sons by accepting him as Savior. Now, the seventh thing, it says, to him the glory and the dominion unto the ages of the ages. And that's emphasizing eternity. Amen. How wonderful here. Now, Amen here. He is the Amen. We saw in Isaiah, that's a title for him. Jesus Christ is both the subject and the object of this book. He's the mover of all events, and all events move toward him. He is the far-off eternal purpose in everything. All things were not only made by him, but all things were made for him. And this universe exists for him. 